I thank God for him touching my life at a young, young person and giving me the gifts and talents that he's given me to use for him. And I have always used it for him. I feel he's anointing power today. Oh, without him, we are nothing. Without him, you might as well go on home. It's just another meeting if Jesus is not here. And um, the message that uh, Pastor had asked me to do, I'm very familiar with what is called a miracle. I'm standing proof here today as a living miracle. We're going to go down memory lane or miracle lane is what I was, I'm going to call it today. And we're going to visit some of the stories. You know, there is so many stories in God's word of miracles from the Old and to the New Testament. There's no way that a person could sum it all up and give you an idea of what had happened and how God supernaturally came whether it be through his son Jesus or before him, he worked mighty, supernatural miracles, whether it be healing or provision, you know. And sometimes when we think about miracles, we, we're kind of callous to them all. Kind of callous. They say, oh, yeah. You know, she's told her testimony, and I, I know what happened to her, and no biggie. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> it was big. If it happened to you and God showed up in your life, no matter what it was with your, what, what you faced, and he changed the course of time, he changed my history because I could have been gone. And he changed history. And usually when you see the miraculous miracles supernaturally done that change the history of time, but before I get in God's word, I want to sing something to you today that I've sung before. And I hope that, and it's, it's been dressed up, it's an old hymn, but it's been dressed up for today and stuff. But the words say it all. Please don't pass me by for anything, Lord. I want everything that you have for me, I'm not going to leave until I receive it. So let's, let's give a listen to the, this old song, and hopefully it will penetrate your heart and encourage you today.
Savior. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you for having the privilege today to be here with your people and minister to them. I thank you while you were preparing my heart on this message that you've given me. I've prayed to you, God, that lives will be changed, not just for this moment, not just hearing the miracles, God, the, the great and mighty miracles, whether they're great or small, the things that you've done for your people throughout history, and the things that you do even as we speak today, this very instant, somebody's receiving a miracle. I just thank you, God, that we can point the direction to those that had trials and tribulations like we have trials and tribulations. And maybe something that is said today in these stories can encourage them to build them up, to know that there is a God that cares, and he's a healer. He's a provider. He's a comforter. He's a friend. He's a person that will uh, bring salvation to those that are lost. I thank you, God, for this opportunity. Now, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. We've welcomed you already in song, but God, I welcome you here to have reign in this place. God, let them not see me. Not, let nothing that comes out of these lips, let it only be you. Let it only be your words, Father God. And I ask that the ministering angels go in every aisle in this place and set the captives free, Father, and even heal them as they hear the spoken word this morning. And I pray for the power and the evidence, God, of your supernatural power to show up today. To show up today. Satan, I give you the notice today that you have no reign in this place. You have no reign. You have no reign on your mind or body or spirit. And I ask you and rebuke you in the name of Jesus to go into a dry place as far as the east is from the west. You will not be lying to them and saying something completely different from what God is intended to, to say in this place. Father, just change hearts this morning. And I pray for the joy of the Lord to return into their bodies. Because it is joy that we see these people miraculously healed and history has changed. And I give you all the praise. I give you all the honor that is due. In your precious name, amen. You know, sometimes it's not easy to speak at your own home church. It's easier to go out with people that you don't know and just kind of go by what the Holy Spirit is directing you to say and do. But sometimes, you know, being in a church family that knows you and has known you for many years, sometimes it is difficult because a lot of times what you say is like, oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that. Like a kid. But sometimes I have to direct that question. Do you really know? Do you really know? I have to direct it myself too. Sometimes I catch myself, oh, I know that. And then God says, uh, do you really know? Some say that miracles are not of today. In fact, they, they don't even preach miracles anymore. And I'm here to tell you that that is a lie from the pit of hell. Because God still saves and heals and does his miraculous uh, miracles throughout this world. It's not just here in the United States, even though we are a blessed nation. He is around this world. He, if he can see the sparrow and take care of it, what can he do for you? What can he do for you? So many churches, as we've been her hearing from pastor even, and even in Mike Keyes had said it, that, that it is a Christless church anymore. And they don't preach the Gospels. They don't preach the cross. They don't pre preach the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for you and me. They don't want any gory violence to be known in the pulpit or in the congregation. They don't want to offend nobody. And I can tell you right now, that's a travesty. Because my Bible says 
that God has given us pastors and evangelists, the fivefold ministry, and especially the pastors, to lead and correct and love. And sometimes we do get offended because of the truth. And it's time, church, to stop sucking our thumbs and allowing God to correct us. Because I can tell you one, <laughs> one short day is coming for the King of Kings and the Lords to show up. And if you miss getting ready and you say, I've got all the time in the world, I'm telling you, friend, you don't. Because I can tell you right now, if you miss that trip, you're going to go to the nearest church and knock on their door wide open and try to find that pastor or find that friend. Why did you let me know? And God said, we did. You had said to yourself, you have all the time in the world. You know, I don't need to do that right now. And so God is giving us direction in this church. I thank God for that. He is bringing back the five-fold ministry where it belongs. And pastor has been hearing, and we've been meeting regularly for prayer, the fivefold and that has offices, and those that have the, the gifts, we invite you to come too. But, you know, without the fivefold, you know, in operation, you know, it, it, it's, you're actually operating not full, fully loaded. It's like a gun. You got the gun in your hand, but there's no ammunition in it. So I thank God that Pastor Tony is directing us in the right direction when it comes to lead, be led, led by the Holy Spirit. He has stepped himself aside and said, look, I've, I know there's times I, I've been in the way. I know I'm in the way a lot of times every day of my life. I'm probably in the way for God to do something in me. But he has allowed himself to step away and say, Lord, it is, it is, this is your church. This is what you ask us to, to help oversee. So you take over the service. And I am so very excited for that because not often do you go anywhere and have a pastor that has an obedience to the Holy Spirit. And I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. I've been a Christian all my life, and I've seen many, many things happen, things on the road. I've seen many miracles while even just observing or when I participated. Many miracles has happened in my life. And if you would have asked me four years ago, that uh, September on the 20th, uh, before that miracle happened to me, if I believed in miracles, I could tell you I, I would have said yes. But after that, that time, and the miracle happened in my life, he's made himself more real. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, even though I believed it before, I now so very much believe miracles are for today. And I want you to see the very same thing that God showed me while lying on that floor coming back to life. He showed up in my life and made it real. And I'm telling you that we're going to take this trip down this miracle lane. And we've got it. The little things to cover uh, on, and it's going to be just a touch of a selected few. And we're going to see that lives were changed by supernatural healing and provision. And God um, has changed the lives, and it's from the greatest to the smallest miracles. They did not overlook any of that. They praised God in the, the little things as well as when they did the big things. He, they praised God for it. And as we should do today and not be so calloused and say, oh, okay. And I, I, I'm, I'm sometimes guilty of that, like I said. We, we need to be more observant. I'd like to, to tell you that um, the, the um, meaning of a miracle is an effective or effect of an extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural powers and is ascribed to a supernatural cause. It's an effect, an event manifestation that is considered a work of God. It's a marvel. It's a wonder. 
God is supernatural. He's a supernatural God. He does supernatural things. He speaks supernaturally. And his very first miracle, we find that it's in John 2 that Jesus turned the water into wine. But I'm not going down that memory today. I want to take you to two ladies today. There's a lot of women that just talked in the word that uh, they were barren and they could not have children. Everybody uh, that was spoken about, about these women, they all had different stories. But they all had one thing in common. They could not have children. And Sarah and Abraham was one of those. And we know the story in Genesis chapter 11 through 21 that uh, God was going to bless Abraham. And he guaranteed a covenant promise with him that he would have a ca- uh, countless descendants and that he would be a father of many nations. And Abraham believed he had great faith in God, and he obeyed what God had instructed him to do. He left the land that he knew and took his family and camped in a land that God provided. And all the while, God kept saying, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And there's times when Abraham was troubled by this because he said, God, I don't understand because Sarah, my wife, is barren and has not been able to give me a son. How can I be a father of nations? How can this happen? And so the Lord told him to uh, go outside and look up to the sky. And what he said was to look at the stars and try to count them all and see if you can count them all. And I'm sure that overwhelmed him and said, there is no way that the numbers of of stars is countless. And he said, this is how many you're going to be able to to father. This is how many descendants that you will have. And so the the years went by and he kept trying to be faithful to what God had called him to do. And when he was at 75 years of age, Sarah and Abraham was visited by the Lord and he spoke, he says, Abraham, you're going to be blessed with many children and many, many nations. You're going to be a father of many. And Sarah is going to have a son for you. And do you know what they both did? They fell down and laughed in disbelief. They were in disbelief. Are you kidding me, Lord? I'm 75 years of age. Look at my wife. She's getting up in here. She's still beautiful. Are you serious? God said, you're going to be having a son. And so little time happened, and I think Sarah got in too big of a hurry. She took the matter in her own hands, didn't she? Did you read that? She took the matter in her own hands. She, got, she just got in a hurry. Don't we do that? I'm, well, you know, this, you know, I'm too old. This must have passed me by. I must have missed it, you know. So I'm going to just get involved now, and I'm going to take over by, and, and I'm just going to do this, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask Hagar. I'm going to go to my husband and tell him I'm going to ask Hagar, my servant. I'm going to have her go in and lay with my husband, and she will provide that son that I can't bear. So she went in there to have, and, and you know, that just, it just irritates me because the enemy came in to lie to her. Sarah, you're too old. Look at you. There's no way you can have a baby at this age. You know? There's just, just no way. So years went by, and God spoke again, you know, that he's going to be a father of many and uh, descendants, and, and said, Abraham, Sarah's going to have a child. He's going to have a son. Lo and behold, not too long after that, there was three visitors that came into their camp, and they wined and dined them and, and you know, had fellowship, and, and they spoke to Abraham while Sarah was behind the tent listening and said, Sarah's going to have a son. So he confirmed it. It was somebody else. And you know what? Sarah did it again. She laughed silently in disbelief. But this time... She was called out on it. She was set, uh, was, was set uh, Abraham was sitting there with the visitors and said, why did you laugh, Sarah? Well, she di- denied it. So not only did she step in, tried to fix it herself, 
you know, to rush things up. And, you know, when, when you get in and mess things up, there's usually a mess because usually we cause more trouble for our own self by stepping in and not letting God do what he told and promised us that he would do. We make such a big mess of it. And that's what happened because after Hagar was pregnant with Ishmael, they didn't get along very well, did they? In fact, you know, Hagar was just provoking and, and was just a lovely person. It seemed like a lovely person to be around. It seemed like it was always, you know, she was disobedient and mistreating Sarah all this time. And she went to Abraham and said, look, this is your fault. And Abraham, you know, Abraham just, you know, he said, wait a minute. I throw my hands up. You correct this manner. And at that time, Hagar had all that she could possibly stand, and she was leaving the camp, and the Holy Spirit sent a, a God's angels to her and said, where are you going to go? Where are you going? And she told what was going on, what was in her spirit, what was hurting her, and she, he said, Hagar, you turn around and go back to that camp, and you submit to Sarah. When long after that, Mishmael was is uh, born, and they thought, you know, well, since Sarah is not pregnant, that Ishmael was going to be that son. And God kept telling him, "No, you're going to have a son of your own." And disbelief, both of them disbelieved. You know, a lot of times when God came across, but I think Abraham had more of a head on his shoulders, and knew that God meant business, and said, "Okay, Lord, I'm going to try to have faith in this." And I believe that when the, the hands were left off of, of the issue. Sarah was totally healed, and that womb became opened, and God supernaturally healed her body to where she could have a baby, and they named him Isaac, which means laughter. And it's ironic because she laughed that in disbelief <laughs> that she was going to even have a son. There's another woman... Uh, that uh, is in the Bible that was barren as well, and it was in 1 Samuel, and her name was Rachel. She was married to Echina, and, she, and uh, she had a, he had another wife named Peninnah. And that, I tell you what, that was the biggest mistake. I've heard a lot of preachers in my lifetime, it's a big mistake when you're married to two different people. Nothing works. You know, this person ought to have this. No, I'm going to have this. And it was bickering back and forth and provoking. And, and that's what Penna did to Hannah pretty much all the days that she was with, you know, uh, them together. And uh, it got so bad that she became so brokenhearted. And she would go behind scenes and weep bitterly. I mean, cry out to God. I'm so unworthy. I can't even have my own son. You know, and here, here you know, Penna, he, she, she always, already had the children and stuff, and she's, you know, she, and she's making fun of me all the time. Lord, I can't take this anymore. So one time at a sacrifice meal, she was at the table. And I think that she probably had a day of all days. But the Bible said she stood up from that meal, and she wasn't even partaking in the meal itself. She stood up and left to go pray. And it happened to be that Eli, the chief priest, was on his perch, it says, and he was watching and observing Hannah. And he, and he just couldn't believe, because all she was doing is, She was in such anguish, pouring her heart out to God. And Eli, he wasn't really right with God back then. He had two evil, wicked sons, the Bible says. And he thought, well, she's drunk. She's drunk. And so he hollered over there, Hannah, why are you here and you're drunk? Put away your wine. Get rid of it. And Hannah says, I assure you, God, or uh, my Lord, this was Eli that she was talking to, and said, I am not drunk. I am very much sober. I am not a wicked person, so don't think that I'm a wicked person. 
I just am, I'm, I'm in deep contrition. I want God to hear my voice. And during that time when she was praying silently, she says, Dear God, if only you would just give me a son. I'll give him back to you, and he will serve you all the days of his life, and not one hair on his head will be cut by a razor. Well, when Eli says, well, in that case, then, may the God of Israel grant you what you have cried for. And so Hannah said, thank you, sir. And she went back to that meal. Her countenance had changed. She wasn't sad any longer because God spoke to her spirit. Just that little nudge. She ate. And it wasn't too long after that that God opened her womb and Samuel was born. And Samuel was one of the greatest prophets that the Bible says. And he even was in charge of a school of the prophets that God uh, had given these gifted men to oversee. And it, it's, I praise God because if it wasn't for Anna's fervent prayer, crying out to God in desperation, change this situation for me. Please, God, I need you now. Isn't it time that we sometimes get on our knees and say, God, I need you to work in this situation. It may not be a barren type woman, but it may be something that you're struggling with. It might be sin. It may be an addiction. It may be something that you need of provision. But God, if you cry out and, and a fervor, and it's a condition of your heart, it's, because, it's not but what you want. It's what you need that God wants to supply. I will supply all. All your, according to his riches in glory. Let's go on down and even in this church. I'm happy to report that God is a God that's still on the throne. He has a supernatural power to heal the barren woman. In Jordan and Laura Hensley's case, my God went down to her womb. She had difficulty trying to conceive. She told me about six years, finally, went to the doctors for help. And, and finally, even though there was a couple of miscarriages, she was able to have two precious miracles today. And I thank God for it. Give him a hand of praise because God is still working miracles. There's two stories that I want to touch on on the miracles of blindness. And in Mark 8, 22 uh, through uh, 25, it is, it is really a strange healing in this place where Jesus uh, did these two men. It's similar, similar stories, but and how he approached. And I don't know about you, and I'll say something here in a few minutes, but he said that the people had brought this blind man to him. And said, Lord, he needs to have a healing. So Jesus stepped out and he took his hand and they went outside the village. All of a sudden, you could hear this. How gross. And I'm going, when I first saw that, I thought, no. It happened. He spit on his eyes. He laid his hands on his eyes on that spit. Said, be healed. And then he asked him, do you see? He says, well, I see people, but they look like trees. So he laid his hands on that spit again. And said, be healed. And he was able to see. He recovered his blindness. The other man that I want to talk and touch you about is in John 9. And we learn that he was blind at birth. And this was a, a kind of a different story. He knelt down and spit in that dirt, created a mud, placed it on that guy's eyeballs, lids. Says, now, go to the pool of Shalom and wash yourself. So he did. And he could see. And people noticed. And he said, what in the world happened to you? And he told the story. He said, this man healed me. Even the word 
went to the Pharisees. Don't you just love the Pharisees? The shoulda, coulda, woulda. I know it all. Don't question me type people. And they were always trying to lurk and be around when Jesus was there because they wanted to make sure that if there was anything they could trip Jesus up with, they were going to because they were so jealous of him and the works that God did and the signs and the wonders and the teachings. And they, they didn't like him. They, they, they feared that they were going to be, you know, no longer a priest or whatever. You know, they just, they wanted him gone. So they did everything, as you can tell, in the New Testament and all the books of the Bible, uh, the, the Gospels. And so the Pharisees got a hold of this man and said, what happened? Aren't you the guy that always is at the gate begging all the time? What happened to you? I was healed by this man, man named Jesus. You were healed? And they questioned him and questioned him. What do you mean you got healed? You know, who is this guy anyway? Where, is, where does this guy come from? They went to the extent of going and calling his parents. And he's, he's of age. He can tell his own story. And he asked the parents, was this guy truly b uh, blind at birth? And, well, yeah, he, he was blind at birth. Well, what happened to him? Well, I don't know, but my son is now able to see, and he's healed. He says, why don't you go and ask my son? He can tell you. He's old enough to tell you. And so they hammered again the questioning, 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 always trying to put doubt. <laughs> Doesn't that the way the enemy works? You know, he's putting doubt and confusion and, and stuff. And that's exactly what was going on at this particular scene. But this man had enough and said, look, I've already told you and explained it to you that this man Jesus healed me. You, don't you know who he is? Don't you know where he has come from? I know one thing. If a person come up and spit in my face, or any of you, some of them, I, I, would, I would dread to think what would happen. I think the pride would be arisen in your spirit, and we would not only just lay hands, but have to pray that they would recover uh, from laying on of hands. <laughs> Jesus does a lot of things so people can remember the miracles. I believe that was a miracle that he wanted them to see who he was and what he's able to do and that he was the son of God and I, I believe that with all my heart and so let's go back down the road into second kings of five or fifth chapter where there's leprosy and you know back then if you had leprosy they had a place for you to stay they didn't even want you in the village and if you did approach anybody you would have to say I'm clean I'm clean and so this man named Naaman, who was a commander in this king's army, he was a great, mighty warrior, but he was very prideful, very prideful. And he had leprosy. And so his wife had a servant, and she was concerned, and she went to her, and she said, I just wish Naaman would go to the king and, and have that prophet in Samaria pray over him that he could be well again. Well, Naaman went to the king and told the king what this servant had said. And he said, well, why don't you go and visit him? And I'll, I'll write you a letter of introduction. And, uh, and we'll just give you the gifts, you know, to take to him. So they, they did. They went there. But then when the king there received the letter and all these gifts, he got so very angry. Read it. That king thought, this is a plot. They're going to come and fight me. You know, and they're going to catch me off guard. And he, the more he thought about it, the angrier he got. But Elisha got on the scene and said, King, oh king, what's going on? Just send, send Naaman to me. And so that's what he did. He sent Naaman down to his house. 
But instead of Elisha coming to the door to greet him, he sent a messenger. It says, go to the Jordan River and dip seven times and your skin will be restored and brand new. Well, this made this prideful giant of a commander angry. What in the world? I came to see him. I thought he'd come out and wave his hand and over me and he would heal my body. Da, 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 da. And doesn't he know who I am? I'm such and such, the commander of this king's army. Who does he think he is? And on and on. And the matter he got, the more rage it started to come out. And so if you see a person in rage, what happens? A lot of times sin is right there. But the officer, and he was ready, and he packed his stuff, and he said, I'm going back. And he left in rage, but his officer that was with him said, wait, 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 wait. Naaman, why don't you just obey what Elisha told you to do? If it was something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So he convinced Naaman to turn back around, and 30 miles he had to walk. He thought, you know, there's many other rivers around here. Why can't I just go to that one instead of just going clear down to Jordan? Taking the easy uh, way out. No, he says, let's go to the Jordan. So they took this trip. They went to the Jordan. He dipped himself. And I'm sure he's going seven times. Come on. Can you imagine if you are desperate you were unclean, but you didn't want anybody to know, and you were a commander-in-chief of something or a leader or, or somebody that, you know, you were responsible for, and you didn't want them to know of what you had. And, but God was working through this officer. He said, just do what he said to do. Just do it. Be obedient, Naaman. It's just right around the corner. Just trust and have faith. And that's what happened. He, we went ahead and he dipped himself uh, seven times. And he became clean. He became clean. The skin was brand new and restored. Then as we go further on down in Matthew 8, and it's also found in Luke 7, of a centurion Roman soldier, who's, well, he was the captain of it. And he had a, a servant that he dearly loved. He dearly loved him. And he said this, this servant was really ill and getting ready to die. And he didn't want that because he, he really thought a lot of this servant. So he was very kind to the Jewish people there. And, and he helped and, you know, and he helped with the, the, the Bible said he, he even helped with the synagogue and, and build it and things. And so he said, if I just go to this Jewish teacher and tell him about my servant, maybe this Jewish leader will go to Jesus and tell him about my servant. And, and you know, he, he can become well. Because he, he's heard the, the healings and the signs and wonders of what Jesus had did. So Jesus heard word and he says, okay. And so he was taken off to go to his house and was about ready to come to his house. And this friend met him along the way and said, Lord, 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 you are not worthy to come into my house. Because back then, he was a Roman soldier and a Jew, and you just, you just don't do those things in the Jewish law. And he said, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. But if you just speak the word, <laughs> I know if you just speak it, God, my servant can be healed. Just speak it, Father. Sometimes I have to say the same thing. Lord, just, just speak the word. And that situation will turn around. Just speak your word. So Jesus was moved greatly with this, this faith of this soldier. And he said, Nobody, not even my Jewish family, my, the Jewish people, has showed me great faith. But this soldier did. 
And he told this friend, he says, okay, you go back and you say, I speak the word that he would be healed. And that friend returned, and here this servant was sitting up and was well as well as can be just because God spoke the word, be healed. Be healed. Supernatural power. And sometimes just the mentioning of his name, Jesus. That's all you can say sometimes. There's no words that even come to mind. Jesus. There's more power in that name, Jesus. Just speak the name of Jesus. And it's done. Let's go down a little bit further down the road. Mark 2 and Luke 5 has uh, got a strange one here. That Jesus was in Capernaum in this, this house. And he was preaching, but this house was packed inside and out. No room. But this, these four men that carried this mat of their friend that was paralyzed, said, we've got to get him to Jesus. And there was no room, like I said. They were trying to push to the front. And so what they ended up doing is crawling up on top of this uh, roof and lowering this mat all the way down, front and center where Jesus was speaking. Can you imagine in this roof something lowering down? It could happen. Jesus says... What great faith you got. Your sins are forgiven. Lo and behold, the Pharisees was front and center again. What is he talking about? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus heard them murmuring. Would it be easier to say your sins are forgiven? Or rise, take up your mat, and go home. So that's what he ended up saying. Rise, take up your mat, and go home. And he was healed. He jumped. He jumped up, the Bible says. I'm healed finally. I'm no longer paralyzed. I'm no longer lame. I can walk again. Can you rejoice with me? Can you just rejoice with me? God showed up on a desperate desperate need then finally we have a woman in mark 5 that for 12 straight long agony years had this blood deficiency an issue of blood back in leviticus on 15 it, it it talks about this type of disease and that it was similar to uh in their Jewish law, that they were unclean. Everything that they uh, ate out of or slept on or sat on, even walked on, they were not allowed to sit, eat, lay, because they would become unclean as well. So it was not talked about what she had. It was, wasn't appropriate. But she was in excruciating pain. She was miserable. And she had gone to every doctor thinkable. She is now broke because of spending all our money trying to find a cure. So the temple would not allow her to go in. How would you like it if nobody was around to help you, not even doctors? And it made it worse if you did go see them. And that's what happened. The Bible says that she got worse after seeing them and paying all this money. So she was broke. She was an outcast. She couldn't have any family and friends because of this issue. The temple didn't want her even in. The church wasn't even going to bother helping her out either. You know? You're unfit. You're unclean. So desperate, so desperate, I've got to get a healing touch. I've got to be healed in my body. I've suffered so long. If only I heard Jesus is passing by. If only I could just press through crowds and just, you know, reach my hand out and just touch the hem of his robe. That's exactly what happened. She touched the hem of his robe that all else has failed, but. I'm going to try one more time. This has got to work. 
And she reached out and touched his robe. And immediately, Jesus knew exactly something happened. The healing virtue flew out of my robe. What, who touched me? And the crowds were, were all about. And he was on his way to a different person's house to pray for a child, a daughter, when this happened. And the disciple says, what do you mean, Lord? There's so many of them here. You're bound to get touched. No, no, you don't understand. Someone touched me. And healing came out. Who was it? Who was it? And finally, finally this woman, trembling before everybody, thinking, oh, no. She knew when she touched him, she was totally healed. And she was so embarrassed that she even did. But she was so glad because she got her healing. And she said, Oh, Lord, she fell at his feet and said, it was I, God. And she told him his story and says, daughter of faith, be well. You will no longer have to suffer any longer. Oh, my God, it's great. My God is great. Wouldn't you like to have a personal touch by Jesus Christ and say you're, you're, what you've been going through, whether it be healing or whether it be provision, you no longer have to suffer in this any longer because I'm a God that says I am the God that healeth thee and I provide. I give you health. I give you what you need. I am the God of the yesterday and I am the God of today and I'll be the God of tomorrow. She was clean. Now the provision of oil miracle in 2 Kings of 4 and 1 and 7. This wife was a wife of a prophet. And she cried out to Elisha and said that her husband had just died. She had two sons and the creditors was on their way to this house to collect the debt. And if they didn't have the debt, they was going to take these two sons to make them to be slaves to pay for the debt. Elisha, what can I do? What can I do, Elisha? And he says, okay, what do you got in the house? And he says, oh, I don't have much at all, Lord, but just a small bottle of oil. This is what you're going to do. You take your sons and you go to the neighbor's house and gather up as many clay jars and bring them back to your home. Close the door behind you and I'll tell you then what to do. So they did. They gathered as many as they could. They gathered as, uh, what they, armfuls and things, and they went to the house. They closed the door, and now Elisha says, pour the oil in these jars. And every one of them were full. How can this be? A little vial of, of oil filled many deep jars. How can that be but supernatural power? How can that be? Nothing human can do it. Nothing human. So when she saw that there was no more jars, she goes, son, go fetch another one. He says, mom, there's not any more jars. And so that little vial of oil stopped pouring out. He says, now take these jars and go sell them. What's left, you can live off of. God provided the sons didn't have to go to slavery, was able to stay home with their mom and care for their mom and live and be provided for for the rest of their life. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. The last and final story we all know it so well. Even in, as children, it's a, it's a famous Bible story of Lazarus. And we learn that in John 11 that he was so ill and Jesus was away with his disciples and Mary and Martha was so worried and had sent a message to go find Jesus and tell him that Lazarus, who you love, is so ill. You've got to come home. You've got to come here and, and heal him. Well, it wasn't long ago, several days before that, that there was trouble in the city where they lived. And they had to flee for their life. 
So Jesus said, you know, after you heard that, that uh, Lazarus was ill, he says, the end will not lead into death. So he stayed two more days and says, okay, disciples, let's pick up and let's go back to Judea because Lazarus is sleeping and I have to wake him up. And then the disciples said, well, God, he must be feeling better since he's sleeping. He says, no, you don't understand. Lazarus is dead. That's what I mean by sleeping. <laughs> We've got to go tend to him. And they tried to discourage him from going and told him, you know, you know, we were going to be stoned to death, Father. I mean, we can't go back there. We are, we are going. We've got to go back to Lazarus' family and Mary and Martha. So the story goes on. They, they approached the city, and, and we, they found out that Lazarus was in the grave four days. Even Martha said, Lord, his body's going to bound to stink by now. Before that, he says, Martha, don't you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? I ask that to you. Don't you know that he is the resurrection and life? Not just personally your life, but to, to things that seem impossible. Things that there's no way... A human could ever help. So Martha came to him and said, My Lord, you should have been here, and he would have prevented him to die. He would be prevented. He would be living. But I know God will, will help you, and you will do whatever God asks. He says, Well, he will resurrect. He's going to live again. Oh, I know. Here we go. I know. All of us is going to resurrect one. No, you don't understand, Martha. I am the resurrection and life. And so they were led back, and, and Mary came and knew that Jesus was there and said, take me where he's at and roll the stone away. And the best part of this, he called him by name, Lazarus. Lazarus, hear me. Wake up. Come forth. In his bedclothes bound, and he couldn't see. The wrapping was all over him, and he was trying to come out and unwrap him. And he was totally supernaturally healed by the power of God. Just like I can tell you of the miracle that happened to me. I can tell you that there is life after death. And if you were in my place and died five, four years ago, you would see that God was very real and he's a very big God and he doesn't have to do the miracle, but he will. He still does it today. He'll do it tomorrow until he comes. I know how very real life can be. The Bible says it's a vapor. That's not very much gone in an instant. My husband didn't count on that that morning. My kids didn't count on that that morning. Pastor Tony didn't count on that the, the morning. But God used that situation to awaken this church body, I believe, to say, I am real I do miracles. I do signs and wonders. I'm coming again for you. Believe. If you don't want to believe, don't come back. That's your choice. Believe in me. Trust me. Put your faith into action. Even... A lot of times we, when we have the smallest things that happen, the smallest blessings, we kind of overlook that. But we need to be thankful in the little things. 
so that when the big things come about, we can rejoice. Rejoice in the little things as well as the big things because God does them all. He's a supernatural God. He, he blesses you with protection. He blesses you with spiritual needs. He blesses you with peace of mind. He blesses you to have family come to know him and, and the salvation to them. He blesses you with providing for your need of whether it be food or a job or a house, some, maybe a car to get you back and forth to that job. He provides God is my provider. I thank God for that. It's a miracle that we're all here today and living and breathing and having our being in Christ Jesus. We are miracles. It doesn't have to have a devastation and resurrection to come back to life. You walk, you talk, because God placed that breath in you. and He placed that life in you. Supernatural miracles that we need to rejoice in. We need to rejoice and be glad. You ask me today if I believe in miracles, I will flat out tell you as fast as I can, yes, I do. And I hope and pray that God shows you He is a miracle-operating, supernatural God that is in favor for you. He cares for you. Will you bow your heads with me? And Solomon comes to the... Mm. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for these stories. Thank you for each lesson, each lesson to learn of them. Not just the supernatural thing that came out of it, God, but the test, the test and the trials that they had to go forth and, and, and be willing to go through to get their miracle. Sometimes it takes a while for promised things to occur, Lord God. I don't know who you are today. But my God shall supply everything you need. By the times he gives you the prize and gives you everyone, gives you what you want sometimes just to say I love you. every need according to his riches. It means he's not broke. He's not broke. I don't know if you need a job. Somebody here might need a job. You're hanging on to barely a thread and trying to trust, but yet the enemy comes in like a flood and causes confusion and trouble, just like the Pharisees did back then. Maybe it's bullies, you know, that is causing this in your mind because that's where the enemy attacks is in your mind first and then if you don't reason with him he tries to attack you physically or your family it don't matter to him he wants to destroy you because he knows what the end is coming he knows he's ending and he's doing everything he can in his power to convert you to his side of the things that's evil. It's not the right way. God is calling desperately out to you and saying, lean not unto your own understanding. Just trust me. Maybe you're here and you've been down at this altar many, many times for healing and still no evidence of that taking place. But and yet you pray for it. You try to believe. But you're still in pain. You still have to go to the doctor. 
we still have to spend money on doctors and, and medicine. My God can instantly touch you today. Nobody has to be around. He can touch you where you're sitting. That very need that you have can be resolved in just a vapor of a second. Whether it be healing, whether you need something from God for provision. It could be spiritually. A lot of times we often acknowledge the problem physically and mentally and but when it comes to spiritual things we kind of ignore it and our inner man needs to be healed a lot of times from bitterness from offenses from things that's just junk that's been layered and he wants to restore your spirit but you gotta be willing to step out in faith and say God I've made such a mess of it I tried to fix it and made more of a mess and I can't go another day until you bless me until you heal me Till I see the provision somehow, some way coming. God, I need a miracle today. I need your touch. I need to know, God, that you are alive and well and have my being. going by what the Holy Spirit's leading me to do. I wouldn't have it any other way. I want me out of the way. I want God to shine through. I want God to perform His power. I have none to give you. standing here singing this to you. Whoever this is for, it is heal me.
let the fullness of your life now be restored. How I need a brand new touch from you. I want you to examine yourselves today. Is there something that was said to you that encouraged you to step out and have faith today in your walk? Whether it be provision, whether it be healing, or a spiritual thing that, that you want to get the matter taken care of. And I don't want you to think about everybody's going to have all eyeballs on you because you know what? It don't matter. Let them think whatever. It don't matter. The only person that matters is Jesus. And what he thinks and how faithful are you going to be to him and, and trust? How, how trusting are you? What is your belief? Are you like Sarah? Is there disbelief that, that anything can happen to you? Hey, I've been down there several times. It ain't going to do me any good. devil's a liar if you need a touch in your body I don't care what it is I don't mean, care how many times you've been down here for whatever it is I want you to come forward we are going to take care of it this morning there may not be the evidence that you need but you have to keep trusting you got to keep trusting that promise is yes and amen and eventually once you Stand firm in what you believe in. God will give you a miracle. But you got to trust Him. You got to step out. You got to say, Devil, no more. I don't care what my body says, or what it looks like. I trust you, God. I trust you, Father. I believe in you without a shadow of a doubt. You know, the enemy comes to attack me, but Lord, remind me. Remind me who you are. Give me a nudge now and then that I'm on the right track. I'm going to trust you with all that I have. It's just a tiny mustard seed. That's all you have to have, the faith. Those that are financially in, in need, you know, I don't have a job. I need something provided quickly, Lord. Debts are due. I don't know where it's coming from. If you need a financial miracle, come stand up here with us. It don't matter who sees you. God does. It matters to God. He wants to take care of you. After all, you are his sons and his daughter. You are his heir. And if he cares for the sparrow, he's going to care for you a lot more. Come, come, come. Or maybe it's just that you have just been so calloused.